Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. My name is Zaki Hassan. I'm here with Pervez Ahmed. We are celebrating the American Muslim experience on site at the Muppies Conference in downtown Chicago. Downtown Chicago, AKA Gotham City for you. Yeah, for me. That's right. <laughs> but uh, we are actually, yeah, it's, super, it's great to be in Chicago again. And we always like coming back here because one, home to you. It, it Your is origin cool. story, as it were, that we like to unpack. That's true. All starts here. It, it all started here, yeah, exactly. literally. Yeah, my, yeah, right. my story. And what I shared on stage, I mean, my, not so much origin story, but my, I guess, pre, a prequel. Okay. My prequel begins in Chicago because my father, when he immigrated here to the United States, the first place he came and settled was Chicago. And he lived here for four years, uh, yeah, almost four years, because he went, he did his undergrad here, and uh, then went back home and married my mom. Well, what is it about Chicago? Because that's a very common, right? It was like a, it was like a Daisy hub. A Daisy hub, so much so that it became known as the more commonly used expression, Chicago Sharif. <laughs> In fact, no, no, and then you laugh, but no, no, I've heard past that. guests of the show, Dr. Omar, actually, like he says, that should be its official name because he holds Chicago as being such a pivotal part of the American Muslim story. Hmm. And but why? See, that's what I mean. Yeah, well, I guess maybe we can unpack some of that, if you will, with the guest we have today, who is uh, we are joined. And by... I say that because she now lives in Chicago, and so perhaps she can shed some light on your. Uh, on the question that you asked. That's, well, and, and before we even introduce our guest, I want to give thanks to Armar, who flew out with us and is yes. running our audio and making us sound lovely and uh, far better than we probably do in real life. So thank you, Armar, for that. Uh, Kalia Abiade is our guest for this episode. However, she's the Managing Director for Strategy and Partnerships at the Pillars Fund, an organization that amplifies the talents, narratives, and leadership of American Muslims. So nice overlap with our mission statement. Absolutely. Here at Diffuse Congruence, Kalia has more than 15 years of experience as a newspaper journalist and editor, and her analysis has been published and cited in the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, all fake news, uh, we are told by, by uh, uh, POTUS, uh, The Nation, National Public Radio, Public Radio International, and the Associated Press, among other outlets. She currently serves on the board of Grantmakers Concerned with Immigrants and Refugees and is part of a national network of trained healing practitioners through the W.K. Kellogg Foundation uh, TRHT Initiative. Kalia, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me, and welcome back home. Oh, it's, it's always good to be back. That's right. But we're bringing a little bit of home with us for you because I didn't know this because I was just associ associated you with Chicago, um, that you are actually from California. I am. Yeah. I talk about that as my homeland. <laughs> That's right. And so as you know, as, as someone who's at least heard a handful of our episodes, and thank you again always for that, but um, we like to begin with people's origin stories. So you hail from the Golden State. And what part of the Golden State? I was born in Fresno, but I would say we were a satellite part of our family in Fresno, so I don't have deep roots there. And um, if we're talking origin stories, I mean, Fresno is definitely my, like where I was born, but I loved how you talked about that prequel. Um, I have that Chicago connection as well, um, even though Part of my family is Filipino. My grandmother came over as a Filipino nurse. Um, very sort of classic Filipino nurse story. And one of her first places um, that she came to in the States was Chicago, and specifically to a hospital in the neighborhood where I currently live. Now, you said your grandmother? You my said? grandmother. So your maternal, paternal? Maternal. Maternal side. And would she be the first in your family to immigrate to the United States? No. Oh, okay. No. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. Well, because... But, you, you have one part of your background is Filipino. Sorry, yes. I was getting ahead of myself. Yes, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. so there yeah. is a connection to Chicago on the other That's side right. too. Yeah. My father didn't live here, but he was a Pullman porter briefly as a young person. And um, one of our family members who were still not quite sure exactly how we're linked to him, but they called him Big Dad, right? So he was born in Corsicana, Texas, immigrated to, uh, you know, migrated yeah. to the Bay Area mm. and became a leader in um, the Pullman Porter Union that was, you know, really based in Oakland. That's right. And my grandmother, um, Kate, like left Corsicana and went to live with Big Dad, right? So Big Dad really helped uh, a lot of people, young folks in the family get jobs and, you know, in between things. So after my dad graduated from high school, 
he did the route from Oakland to Chicago, back and forth and back and forth. And then he was like, this is really not for me. I can't do it. <laughs> but thanks, Big Dad, and he moved on to another wow. part of his But now, career. his background is not from the Philippines. My dad, no, my dad's family. Uh, this is one of those trick questions we were talking about with the where are you from. <laughs> yeah, People yeah. ask, right. I keep going, I said Texas. And they're like, what about before then? South Carolina. I'm like, you really want to keep going? Because <laughs> we yeah. somewhere on the shores of West Africa and we're not right. entirely sure. Got it, got it. Now, it's funny you say Corsicana. Obviously, I'm from Texas, as any of our listeners know. But um, Corsicana now, I don't know if you've ever been. Okay, so Corsicana is infamous for being a speed trap. Meaning you're, you're cruising down I, uh, Interstate 59, and when you hit Corsicana, you know that you better slow down because, and I've gotten, and I've been guilty of it, I've gotten a number of speeding tickets all saying I need to appear in some courthouse in Corsicana. Of course, you never do, you pay the fine, but it's a nice little revenue stream for <laughs> the city of Corsicana. You gotta make your money. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. So, Corsicana was always that spot, but anyway. Um, because, yeah, anyway, on, on many a road trips. So, um, how, what a fascinating story. Um, so then, uh, yeah, take us back to Fresno then, um, yeah. growing up there and, and how that was like. I think you'd be certainly our first guest to be born in the Central Valley. And so, I, 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 I mean, as Bay Area people, you know, I mean, and you know this, California is so big and so vast and so diverse geographically and otherwise that- Ideologically. It's all, ideologically that it's almost like three or four different countries, and which is why you've got this whole, there was a movement to split, split it up into there you go. different states. Yeah. Exactly. And so Central Valley has always been very different. And or I think it's safe to say that California is very, uh, Central Valley is very different than the Bay Area, certainly. And Southern. And, and Southern California, exactly. So what is it that in your estimation as someone who spent, what, your early formative years there? 14? 14 years. You had mentioned off mic, years. yeah. What what is different from you know in terms of yeah your your experiences living there versus having experienced other parts of California and of course now living in the big city of Chicago that is unique to Central Valley the breadbasket of California right yeah. I mean so growing up in Central California was always I always felt. Like I mentioned, being that satellite family, I always remember my parents saying like that they had never intended to stay. Like they went to school at Fresno State, and so there was always this idea of home being somewhere else. Home was the Bay Area, right? Home for my grandparents. Uh, my grand on my mother's side was the Philippines, but they had been in California for so long um, that you know we you learn how to just make home where you are because you can have this idea of a physical place of home, which I think is really important. And I had that, but it wasn't in Fresno. My physical rootedness and home was in the Bay Area, was in Lathrop, another part of the Central Valley. Um, but I had great experiences. Now I knew, I learned later that Fresno had this reputation for being a, a meth capital of the country, um, you know, that it had a lot of struggles around labor, um, that despite, you know, its role in providing so much agriculture for so much of the rest of the country, let yeah. alone the state, um, that there were actually a lot of people dealing with a lot of challenges. I mean, when I said breadbasket, it wasn't just a euphemism. I mean, it very much was. And and you talk about the labor movement, and you can't, yeah, you can't talk about Central Valley or Salinas Valley without talking about like Cesar Chavez and exactly. and, the, and the labor movement. So, um, but that's all part of the I guess milieu of Central Valley, you would say. More so than, say, Oakland, right? Or something like that. Although Oakland has its own unique struggles. Completely. But do you know what I mean? But like, th th there's just something very unique about the Central Valley experience. I think so. You yeah. know, I used to come home with school papers mm -hmm. in English on one side and four languages on the other. And that was just, I got used to it, right? I didn't know anything wow. else. I didn't realize right. that every school didn't have extensive and multi-directional English as second language programs because that wasn't my, you know, I didn't know that that wasn't normal until I moved to Northern Florida and you got put in a box. <laughs> it's like, you're either this or you're that. Like, what are you exactly? You're not white. You're not black. I don't know where to put you. And I'm like, I am black. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Wow. That is fascinating. Multiracial kind of, yeah. And in and, and certain parts of the country, that's just, yeah, like you said. It's such an anomaly that they don't even know how to place you. And that becomes important for people. 
Definitely. I think they Definitely. want to. Yeah, more they gotta be able to, than for Yeah, me. yeah, exactly. Cool. That's what I mean. For people, they need to be able to check the box. Um, so I guess you, you've already kind of teased it. So uh, a- after those early years, so 14 would mean you were just about to start a high school or you had already started high school? Three days before high school. Wow. And you get uprooted and you move where? I moved to Gainesville, Florida, the home of the University of Florida, where my dad worked. Uh, we took- Not a- the hurricanes, were they? That's Miami. Sorry, yeah. University of Miami. It's okay. Get I a know pass. this though. No, I, I'm just an old man. Tell me who the uh, what's the, the Gators. 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 Hello, Water Boy or something. There's some movie reference in there, but maybe Zucky can remember. But anyway, sorry. Yeah, they, I think it's the Water Boy. I think it's Water Boy. Bobby Boucher. And there's some connection to the Gators. But anyway, sorry. We just we just took a left turn into Adam Sandler's filmography. <laughs> so I'm glad we're. We're taking full advantage of Kalia's time. With sorry, us. sorry. Okay, B- back to the Gators. Um, what was so Gainesville? I've never been to Gainesville, but I've been to Miami and been to Orlando <laughs> more than I like to admit. But um, what's what was different, say, about those experiences in Gainesville? Well, but it's a college town. It is a college okay. town. It almost it, in my time there, anyway. It revolves so much around the college. And I didn't understand Gainesville. I didn't understand. And I know this sounds a little bit hyperbolic. And Cameron encouraged us against being hyperbolic (laughs) earlier. But I'm just going to say it anyway. I just did not understand that it was the South at all. I had, I thought Miami Vice, um, the beach, I thought Disney World. I was going to have like this fantastic palm trees and, you know, drinks with umbrellas, kind of, you know, fruity things. That was my sure, sure. perception as a 14-year-old. So when I was talking about the hyperbole, I didn't, I realized that I didn't understand America, mm, right? I didn't understand that's profound. the South. Yeah. Um, even though I have these family roots there, no clue. So I think as, as hard as it was to move to a new city uh, from a very diverse place um, at three days before ninth grade, with no friends. Jeez. Yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> I know. Seriously, I'm hearing that and like I'm getting hives just hearing it because I know how traumatic that I, can be. I do too. To like a ninth grader. Yeah. Oh, you know? absolutely. It's, Especially at that age. I, mean, I would I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. I mean, it's it's at that age. It's it's really brutal. And I I was I lived through that. Yeah, right. Yeah. And you were coming from a foreign country. I came from Saudi Arabia yeah. to the States. I did eighth grade. And, and uh, in fact, here in Orland Park, for, for half a semester, I went to a junior high straight out, straight from Saudi Arabia. And to this day, I'm, I'm 40 years old in a few days, I think of those six, five, four months as the worst stretch of my life, which, big picture, that's, uh, you know, no, not the worst thing No, that's real, though. And it, I it don't is real. think that any of us in our family understood what a rupture it would be. And now as a parent... I'm like, absolutely not. We are staying here. We started here in kindergarten. <laughs> yeah. We're graduating. Yeah. yeah. Good. I, I exactly. so agree with so you. So true. You know, you're absolutely right. Because I, I, very similar to sort of Zucky's story, except at younger, like I went to three different elementary schools, two different uh, middle schools, and two high schools. So I, I share that. And it is brutal. And I've moved in the middle of a school year, which is even, right? Because I, I did half of sixth grade in Texas and then half of sixth grade in Alaska. So talk about. Um, wow. And the only saving grace there was, because you, you talk about six months of trauma. I, for me, that was sixth grade, um, in spite of the fact that it was, it was in Houston where I had, where I'd spent you know a couple of years of already elementary school, but it was just being you know sixth grade in a huge right. I mean, being a sixth grader in a huge school. Yeah. But the saving grace of moving to Alaska was that it wasn't sixth grade was elementary school up there, and it was yeah. just like so. I went from being the on the bottom of the totem pole or the food chain <laughs> to being the top. Yeah. So that was great. And then we moved overseas. But anyway, so um, sorry, we're talking about you though, not about us. Um, but no, <laughs> it, it, no, but it, we always like what we, I think what we enjoy most about these type of opportunities we have is how much we share in common. I mean, right? I mean, we, on paper, we shouldn't share anything in common, but we do. And that's the beauty of it. And that's what we're learning with the podcast that we've been doing for so long. And the you know, number, the umpteen amount of guests that we've had is that there's so much um, 
Mm. Congruence. I almost forgot the name of our podcast. Podcast. Well, I mean, people yeah. focus on the diffuse part, but there's a lot of congruence. Right. Well, and and you know, in in a broader sense, I mean, obviously, we're talking about the American Muslim experience, but there's when you take a step back, where there's the human experience, and that transcends uh, a lot of different experiences. You know, I mean, uh, like I said, I think a lot of people are going to hear what you're describing, just just what you've said thus far, and very on a very a visceral, visceral yeah. level, be able to relate to that. I was a monster during that time. So apologies <laughs> to my parents. But right. it was such a rupture that, I mean, I was yeah. completely just out of my mind. And I think I can look back at that now and, com- you know. But that that was a reaction to your having yes. dealt, well, been dealt this massive it disruption. It is, but it's also an exacerbation of stuff you're already experiencing, right, you're experiencing at 14. Yeah, you're just a, as a father you're just of a, a 16 mess. year old you're not there yet i don't think you're there yet no, oh, but I, as a there. father of a 16 year old i mean i can tell you and now a 10 year old who is probably starting hormonal changes early or something because <laughs> she's going through her own stuff which is it's traumatic just in a in, in in a bubble let alone the context of what you're talking about which is this this rupture right. and this upheaval and I think you yeah. layer over that, yeah. right, the experience of being in this multicultural yeah. place that celebrated how multi, you know, we're so yeah. advanced and we're so multicultural. And then to a place that is, Gainesville is a really particular place in Florida, has a really particular history um, with, you know, race and racism. And one of the, the sort of field trips that we used to take in, in college was to Rosewood which was the site of a massive attack on black communities. Um, so I got oriented to that really quickly. So when I said, like, I didn't understand America, like, I think about my family took a train from L.A. We drove down to L.A. from Fresno, took a train three nights in these sleeper cars. It was the most fun three days with my family. You know, we ate steak on the Amtrak, and we stopped in a few places. We were in Texas for like three days. It felt like even- cross country. Cross country. And then, so we started in in LA, made a short stop in New Orleans, which I had traveled to before, but then we got off in a city called Palatka, Florida, which most people haven't heard of. In fact, I didn't know Rosewood was in Florida. I've heard of Rosewood and the Rosewood Massacre. I just never knew, I thought it was like, what. When I think of the Deep South, I'm thinking Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, right? Exactly. So I'm, I, I just assume Rosewood was one, one of those states. But it is thank in you. Florida. Okay. And so okay. Palatka is one of these yeah. places, too, where the train, in some of the towns, like in El Paso or in uh, New Orleans, it stopped for a little while, yeah, right? Yeah. Maybe you could get out. Palatka, they stopped just long enough for us to get our bags off the train, and then that train was gone, and we were like stranded on a what have you done? Rail Paris? station. <laughs> Where wow. are we? Yeah. Um, and I visited Palatka again as a junior, sophomore or junior in high school, uh, for a football game. And it's such that at the time in the 90s, the black uh, people who went to Palatka or who were related to folks who were playing football, but who were from Palatka, sat on the visitor's side. It was still segregated in the 90s, and my high school in Gainesville, which was a college town, wasn't actually integrated until 1970. So 10 years before I was born, my high school was integrated. So many of my classmates um, had parents who, who couldn't attend our high school. They went to a different school in the, in the town. So that's how steeped, I mean, we were not that far removed from some of the most traumatic parts of our country's history. Um, no, I thought of something when you when you mentioned this town of uh, Palaka. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I, no, oh yeah, about just just cross country and getting a slice of Americana, as it were, just experiencing those different cities because I've done that. Uh, one moving cross country several times, or yeah, because I, you know I talked about me growing up, but I sort of we continued the tradition after my wife and I got married. Within five years of our marriage, we moved out of Texas and and. You know, the last, you know, I, w- I would say the first, you know, 10 years of our marriage, 15 years of our marriage, we lived in like four different states and that was all, you know, but I was a poor, starving student. So everything was like getting your U-Haul packed and driving your car and your big U-Haul truck cross country yourself. So, um, and I, but it's funny when you talk about, when I'm thinking LA to Florida, I can't think of, I can't help but think of Interstate 10 because mm-hmm. that literally connects that entire, but what you experience along I-10, 
I've done it on the 40, on, mm -hmm. on Interstate 40, or no, sorry, yeah, Interstate 40, which used to be back in the day, you think of like the Jodes and like Gra Grapes of Wrath, right. used to be Route 66, Route yeah. 66. So, but where you have these, um, you know, migrating families and the experiences that they have. So I can only just, you know, imagine you as a 14 year old kind of experiencing that. And that's just fascinating. Um, so do you end up staying in Florida for high school and undergrad? Yes, okay. I did. So and then a day after college, got married. <laughs> oh, wow. uh, somewhere in there, became Muslim. <laughs> uh, okay, so we, we have to, yeah. <laughs> so, I know. so we have to touch on that because, I mean, obviously, you know, we do on the show. And it's not going to be one of those, like, okay, like, what was it, you know, what was the whole, you know, because I know it's a process, it's not an event. But I guess, were you... What was the sort of religious, you know, uh, I guess, yeah, in terms of family? Like, were you yeah. raised a very practicing, you know, Christian or whatever? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So on the Filipino side of my family, it's very Catholic. Okay. Uh, my grandmother was a very devout Catholic. Um, and, you know, we were her, I was her oldest granddaughter. So that was a really important relationship for her. But she was very, very Catholic. Um, and then my dad's side of the family was more of the Baptist tradition. Um, but my dad sort of dabbled in the nation, you know, as a young person oh, of the Nation of Islam. Yeah, yeah. Um, still felt a very strong connection to, like, his church roots, just because so much of that is family. But he also, it, you know, was seeking something. And also, he graduated from Berkeley High School in 1970, right? So there was oh, a lot. Like, right. He had some stories. Of course. Um, you know, sneaking into Jimi Hendrix concerts at Berkeley High. I'm like, those are those kinds of times where you were like, oh, I wish I had, you know, grown up in the 60s. And then you're like, no, just kidding. Like, it was, <laughs> there was a lot going on. Yeah. Um, but so he And had, of course, 1970s Oakland and Berkeley, there's yeah. a lot going on. Oh, uh, so much. Yeah. And you talk about the nation, but like Black Panthers and what's happening with the civil rights movement and... Uh, Carmichael, Stokey Carmichael, and so all just all that. that. I've been all digging. That. So I mentioned to you before that my father passed away earlier this yeah. summer, but there's this photo that exists somewhere of me as a four-year-old standing next to Kwame Ture, Stokely no Carmichael. Yeah, and yeah, I, yeah. it used to sit on his desk at work. So I've been going through every box, and I'm going back this week, and I will. It will be you know full of all of the emotions, but I'm also like, where is that photo? Because yeah. it's just this cur crazy curly-headed me, and I'm like, about at his knee because he was such a tall man. Oh, nice. um, so yeah, that, so the religious part was there, but there was a political and social orientation that was right. very important. Real quick, going back to Oakland just for a second, because I, and I, I don't think I've ever done this on the show, but recommending a past show of ours to a current guest which would be, if you haven't, go back and listen to an episode we did with Sandiata Rashid. So yeah. of the, he's the Amir of the Lighthouse yeah, Mosque yeah. That, that you may have heard of in Oakland. Definitely. And he grows up in Oakland and, and his, so his narrative is very much the story of Islam in Oakland through the Black Panthers and the NOI and everything else in the Imam Martin community. So that would be, if you haven't already, that'd be, I think a good episode for you to it. check out because again, you, you can, I think fill in so many of the of the pieces of, of what he's talking about because of your own background and your dad's background. Yeah. Like at home. So uh, anyway, sorry, uh, uh, your journey. Yeah, you were talking about your. Yeah. yeah. So faith. faith yeah, faith, right, faith, right. faith. So right. I, I felt like um, in college. Your, was, your dad had dabbled. That's that's dabbled, where we left off. Dabbled, right? Dabbled so, with the NOI. In when, what sense? Like kind of black. Politics, black identity. For sure, yeah. for sure. Right. Definitely right. through the social and political identity pieces. And there were still parts of it that he felt very close to, even though he, you know, had moved on and sort of re-engaged with the church as he got older. But throughout most of my childhood, he understood and respected how strongly my maternal grandmother felt about our Catholic upbringing. And so he, you know, let it be and let that be at peace. And he didn't interfere with that. Um, but I think when I was in college... I was on my own quest. And so I went, you know, extra hard, like, all right, I'm going to be extra Catholic. And that didn't, that didn't necessarily um, stick with me. I have obviously so many family members um, who are still practicing Catholics and, and we have a very, you know, great relationship, but that was not my path. Um, and so then I was like, you know, I similar, maybe similar to my father. It's like, I'm going to go like 
figure out how to reconnect, and especially being in Florida, like reconnect with this black side of my identity. Um, something that I think you grew up as a mixed race child, never feeling like you're enough, right? So I'm gonna just, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go be all of the things, right? And um, I went in college, I started going to this church in Stark, Florida, which is similar to what, how you describe um, Corsicana, a speed trap. Oh. <laughs> a very, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, very enthusiastic um, environment. Mm. The music was rich. Mm. The community was amazing. I was there um, actually the night of Y2K, right? I was in the church. Um, and it was a very loving and passionate space. But I realized that going extra hard into that was not necessarily my path either. Right. And I um, had the privilege of having some Muslim friends in college who, who were very real with me. And I, I think that's a hard thing to say. It's not that many of the Muslims that I didn't, that I knew weren't real, but it, they weren't, they didn't live lives that felt accessible mm. to me. They mm. didn't have experiences that I felt like I could relate to or that I could be a flawed person. Wow. Even though as I was older, I realized they weren't perfect, but I had this image right. of them as being like floating on water. I remember these, like they were so sweet and so lovely and so nice. And actually prior to converting, I spent um, all of Ramadan like fasting. Oh, wow. I was in the masjid like overnight. We had this really amazing imam who um, would finish the Quran three times in the month, just him by himself. And so we, you know, I, we would spend evenings there and people would be like, are, are you a Muslim? Like, I, you're here all the time. I'm like, no, just, you know, just chill out. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, stop asking me questions. I don't know. Um, but I did have some friends who could really level with me. And I understood there were aspects of their family lives and their upbringings that I could relate to. And I didn't feel like I had to figure it all out before committing to practicing Islam, right? Like I could come as myself. Come and as work, you are. Right. To Islam as it is, right? You finished it, thank you. Um, and that go credit goes to Imam Zaid for that. But anyway, yeah, sorry. Absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> mashallah. Yeah. But um, it was just really, and it was also, uh, this has to be noted, it was just a few months after September 11th, 2001. Right? So people are like, you did what, when, and why? <laughs> <laughs> so... You know, and I've said this on the show because I went back and I was listening to a past episode. I know you don't do that, Zucky. You don't like to. You have a perfectly fine I, voice. I but... I generally don't like hearing myself. But anyway, same. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went. And believe me, I didn't go back out of some love affair for my voice. But um, I went back because I, I I do like listening to people's stories again. Um, and and I had said this on I, again. I can't remember the, the particular guest, but I was talking about how for an older generation of people. Uh, people beyond my vintage, not so before my vintage, um, who, for them, the autobiography of Malcolm X, for example, or racial tensions in the 60s, they were those were the precipitating events that led to their journey or their, you know, that led them down a path that eventually led them to Islam, for example. People, likes of Dr. Omar, Ehsan Bagby, others right. who, they, were, they read the autobiography and they were, in, you know, impacted. But then I've encountered this where for a lot of people, especially of later vintage than mine, so such as yourself, 9-11, uh, surprisingly enough, has served, was that kind of that moment or that, that uh, what's the word, the inception or the, you know, the beginning of this inquiry within or this inquiry about Islam. And as, 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 as almost contradictory as that seems, that, that that's not unique, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I just want you to know, like, I mean, I don't know how much you've like gleaned from talking to other people where, or other converts who come into Islam right around that time where, yeah, 9-11 kind of led them to this journey or began that journey, as I said, much a la, not to say that it's at all compatible, where's the biography of Malcolm X versus, you know, 9-11, but I'm just saying, you know, it's kind of interesting to see. I, in terms I mean, of I, I think maybe it's, just, it's worth it's worth couching what you're saying yeah, in, in right. the framework mm -hmm. of this horrific tragedy. Right. Uh, prompted a lot of people to ask, how could this have happened? And a lot of people, understandably, were like, what 
is this religion saying? And a lot of people, by virtue of that inquiry, were led down this path of realizing, well, this misinterpretation, misappropriation does not speak to what I am seeing. Uh, about Islam, you mean? Yeah, and I think you raise a really good point, and, which is that, that and it needs to be acknowledged that what we see after 9-11, I mean, certainly, you know, much has changed, unfortunately, but changed for the worse, in fact. But in the days, weeks, months after 9-11, if anything, what you saw overwhelmingly, of course, there were the exceptions. You always heard you always heard about the exceptions, but by and large, in terms of our neighbors, our coworkers, our right. Uh, I remember my wife's hairdresser, like literally reaching out out of concern and being like, "Are you okay? Like, we know this, that, that that what happened on you know in New York that it doesn't represent your faith or it doesn't represent you," and. Says, so what I'm saying is it says a lot about America and it says a lot about Americans in terms of here you have this, um, at that time, still very misunderstood minority of like, and I say religious minority, and they were living in a majority, you know, uh, uh, context of people belonging to other faiths, let's say even overwhelmingly Christian. Yet the response, again, by and large, there were exceptions, was one, one of welcome, one of concern, and one of genuine curiosity, right? I think that's About interesting. I, I, yeah, no, I, I definitely saw that. Right. And especially being in Gainesville. I would say, like, the story, you know, the, my yeah. sort of s- intentional seeking sure. predated 9-11. Sure, sure. So it was sort sure. of a... A moment, and and by the time that that had happened, I had felt already pretty connected to the local Muslim community. I think it's interesting you talk about welcome, and and that sort of positioning because I don't. I guess I found myself a little bit frustrated with the Muslim community sure, no, in that no. moment. And as oh I yeah, please will <laughs> I? I love like they were so instrumental to this transition in my life and I owe them so so much and when you know there were these open houses you know to welcome the community in after there were so many outreach efforts that were happening around then if I don't know if in your communities but oh yeah you know inviting people in for Absolutely. a meal and conversation mm-hmm. and then also inviting the FBI and the local police stations in and I was from that orientation that I talked about, that socio-political orientation, and having this rootedness in Black political consciousness, and never questioning my belongingness on this land, I was like, "Why are we doing this? Yeah. You know, like you yeah. are here, you Don't are welcome." We know history, right? And so that was a frustrating point to me because I was like, "If we had a better relationship with Black people and Black Muslims, we might." approach this a little bit differently. We Absolutely. should definitely know our neighbors 100%. Absolutely. Um, but maybe the trust would be in different places. No, that's and I think a really, really good point. Yeah. No, no, that. I think that's an it's, excellent I, point you raised. Yeah, well, and I think that just, that's uh, indicative to some extent of how, uh, you know, the immigrant Muslim community yes, has right. tended to, yeah, I mean, you know, I have very distinct memories. No, no, memories finish your point. Has tended uh, to, sorry, to, Has tended off. to engage in sort of uh, apology and, and Right, uh, like Absolutely. like it's sort of ingratiating yourself to to uh, certain the people. dominant culture, let's say. Yeah, and yeah. and certain people, and not to cast a too broadness aspersion, but you know, certain people who do not have your best interests at heart, you know. And and I remember very distinctly in and this has stayed with me uh, in the mid '90s. There was uh, some event, and I, I want to say it was uh, like a Bosnia during the Bosnia Sarajevo oh. thing, and it was for that. But uh, Henry Hyde, Congressman Henry Hyde, was one of the, Henry, Henry Hyde is in the Hyde Amendment. Oh, right. Henry Hyde, right. who led the impeachment thing against Bill Clinton. Yeah. So he he was one of the speakers who came. And, and I just I just remember the when he was announced, introducing Congressman Henry Hyde, and people are chill, like it's Michael right. Jordan. Right. And, and, and I just. <laughs> Very apt. <laughs> Reference, right, you know, right. You're Michael right here. Jordan, mid like, like <laughs> yeah. right. yeah. nineties, you know, and and I remember people on their feet cheering, and and I I was fifteen maybe, and I remember being like, "What are you guys doing?" Absolutely, you know? 
Now, and I'll share even a, a, a very similar story, but closer to 9-11, in fact. I remember in August of 2001, I was, um, uh, there was a conference that I attended in the city of Houston, put on by an organization I'm not gonna mention, but they were one of these Muslim political organizations. Sure. And the keynote speaker at that event, who also I will not name, was basically heralding, or what was the word, like talking about how instrumental the Muslim bloc vote. And this goes back mm -hmm. to, I think, a point you raised, because about in terms of disenfranchisement within the Muslim community of, 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 of black Muslims and the black Muslim experience, because he was here, it was sort of, you know. This is yeah. circa 2000. No, this is, no, I said this is um, August of 2001. Literally right. a month so, before so, 9-11. So there, thereabouts. Right, so there's enough time that's passed since the election of 2000 where now all this analysis has been done in the mind of this in this, But uh, it's pre-9-11. Correct. So, okay. Post-Bush. But <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. But it was heralding the fact that how instrumental the Muslim bloc vote was, because if you remember, that was a big thing. And it was all based on the one issue that Bush campaigned on, which was about the secret sure. evidence and all that stuff, where all these Muslim organizations and all these largely immigrant Muslim organizations the so-called AKA Muslim bloc vote had endorsed Bush over Gore. Right. Whereas the, the community of Imam, Imam Warathi Muhammad, the community, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, other black Muslim leaders, they weren't part of that. They definitely weren't part of that. And yet here was this, like I said, much lower the sort of like Muslim bloc vote. Yeah. But, you know, again, you talk about hindsight, you know, the, you know, hindsight or what is it, 2020, right? Looking back, I mean, now you see how short-sighted and how well of, had, that, of that analysis had, was. Had, look, right now, overwhelmingly, the American Muslim community tends to vote Democratic. Would that shift have happened didn't, uh, had 9-11 not happened? I don't think so. I agree. I agree. Right? I mean, like, and overwhelmingly. Eight years of Bush, and eight years of Bush. Not just 9-11. But, but 9-11, you can't disentangle the yeah. two. No, no, I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. Sorry. So, uh, oh, but, sorry. We, we no, 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 but I think I, because you raised so many fascinating <laughs> points, and every time I always want to, like, so, sort of ruminate, ruminate about what you're saying. So it's, it's credit to you, but please bring us back to where we were. <laughs> um, because you, you talked about kind of He's your like, feelings oh, early we're, on. No, no, I, I, I'll talk about something. Please. Your, your experiences early on within, like, what you were experiencing within the Muslim community, your mm -hmm. sort of new home. Right. Even, the, or, the frustration yeah, that frustration you espouse, that you yeah. think is... In terms of seeing is, is the overwhelmingly, tough. I would assume, uh, immigrant community mm -hmm. around you sort of, again, trying to curry favor with law enforcement, with the dominant culture, et cetera. And you're like, haven't you read history? Right, and they were you just so- You know of a thing called, uh, 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 count- um, Oh, COINTELPRO. Co COINTELPRO, Absolutely. thank you. Sorry. Yes. Right? And right. please. So, no, I, I mean, it was, I feel like I understood it, but I was also very frustrating, right? And I, I was young and I was new and I was like, maybe you know, Muslims are just so nice. <laughs> that, you know, thankfully that was my experience, yeah. that I was around nice Muslims, I think, at different phases of my life. So it was almost like naivete, you thought, right? right? right. Like, it's just like, they are just such right. nice people. They <laughs> will feed you. I mean, the, you know, the day after I converted, like, these sisters brought a cake and some flowers. I mean, it was just so warm. So I understood. But I was, I think when, you know, you zoom out a little bit, it's like, okay, come on now. Like, how do we orient ourselves where we can speak out and be influential in our own best interests also. And that's not necessarily in opposition to what's happening out there, but there's nothing wrong with a little bit of self-interest when, <laughs> you know, our like lives and livelihoods are on the line. I was just about to say, on the line. about survival. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, but, but, but the fact that people didn't see it that way. And Maybe. Yet, yeah. I was very young in the community, like actually yeah, yeah, yeah. an age young, right. but also new to the no, I think so. I, I don't think you're wrong in sort of assessing that kind of general sense of naivete and and, and, and honestly, political immature, maybe immaturity is too harsh of a word, but we were still in our infancy stage as mm -hmm. a community vis-a-vis -vis politics. Right. And so it was as if, and I say this with love and care, but it was as if, you know, when you first discover something new. And so it was still American Muslims learning about civic engagement. Right. right. And so it was in the early infancy period as a, as a community of our 
civic engagement era. So, so I think I think that that needs to be borne in mind as well. For the listener, I'm saying, not for you, I'm saying, but for the listener, that that was that era where now we seem, oh, well, you know, and I, I, would, I would maybe push back on how politically astute we are or mature we are or what the maturation has been. <laughs> <laughs> because now I see sort of... That's a whole yeah, other... Yeah. No, and, and, and I want to, yeah. I but wanna, I think it's, you know, when you when you look back on that yeah. time, it's, it feels both... Quaint? <laughs> well, I was going to say it feels forever ago yeah, and yeah. a few weeks ago. Wow. Yeah. It it really does. And and that's almost like it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was like a long I mean, time ago. Yet it feels like yesterday. I mean, we had to grow up quick. Yeah. Good point. Right. And and I think I think there was there was an education that ha- happened very rapidly following September 11th in terms of like you know the, the what. How how the the American Muslim voice can be uh, proactively put to use in in yeah, a political yeah. sense. Uh, I think. Sorry, the, some of this for me, like in some of the work that I've been able to do over the last few years. I was just about to say, I think this dovetails so nicely into a conversation that I want to have in a few minutes. We don't need to get there right now because I think there's still some backstory we need to fill. Yeah. But what you're doing at Pillars. Because when I talk about, when I see, when I talk about the maturation of the Muslim community, I herald sort of like the work that Pillars is doing and the particular organizations that Pillars funds, and we'll get into all of that Mm -hmm. in a little bit, as a real indication of how far the Muslim community has come. So I think you are uniquely suited to talk about this. No, I really mean that. No no pressure. No, no. (laughs) Not at all. Right. Single-handedly <laughs> responsible for the maturation of all the Muslim communities. No, but no. I think Pillars <laughs> represents a very unique yeah. chapter, a very yes. new chapter in the um, in the growth of the Muslim community. And I want to get to Pillars and the work it does. And so, and that's why I say the conversation we're having is really interestingly enough very much going to dovetail. I think. Into yeah. That. No, I won't get. Right. So, I just yeah. think what, from my own experience. Right connecting struggles has been really important, right? And understanding, like, so some of the things that were happening post 9-11, I think part of that response is because there there wasn't as much connectedness between issues and across issues and understanding the complexities of our identities. And I talked about, you know, I think about this with my own family history, like both sides of my families being involved in labor movement. So maybe not the same labor movement, but understanding that same struggle for like workers' rights, right, in different ways, in different contexts, or both, you know, migrating to the Bay Area in the 40s, one from overseas and one from Texas, but happening at the same time. So this idea of leaving home and never looking back, right, actually never going back, even though we share land with Texas, my grandmother never went back, right? So that idea of like fleeing your home in the cover of night and landing in the same place, like that helped our families have that connectedness. And so there was not shared experiences, but shared understandings of struggle, shared like elements of that. So I think that's starting to happen in Muslim communities a little bit more. Um, it has happened for years. I don't want to take credit from generations before us who have gotten this right um, in certain pockets. But I think on a larger scale, some of those connections are being made a little bit more. Mm. So I think uh, you were flash you you were sort of flash forwarding about like I think after graduating and then getting married, uh, <laughs> and you were already Muslim at this time. I was. I okay. Was. So and and your husband Muslim also background. converted. Oh, he oh also yeah. converted. Okay, but your last name is is his last name. So that's because another... your, your your last name is obviously as unique as your first. So I would yeah, tell us a little bit about the name too. Yeah. yeah. So my. Growing up, my last name was Robinson. That's my father's last name. And I actually um, wouldn't, I, I don't know if I would have done it the same or different. And I even questioned it at the time, but I did take my husband's last name when we got married. But his last name growing up was Gray, not Abiade. And he decided around 13 when he realized where his name came from, that it most likely came from people that enslaved his family. He was like, as soon as I'm old enough, I'm changing that. So we were young and we were like, we're just gonna go build this new family together. Wow. Um, and so I decided in that moment that, you know, if we have kids, I wanna have the same last name as them and we'll be this little crew of Abiades going through the world, not realizing that people would one, question our Americanness ever, forever after that. And then like every 
um, Nigerian person would get overly excited when they met me, and then I'd have to disappoint them and saying, We're, I don't know, we could be related, but I don't think so. Right. <laughs> but I actually don't know. So Abiyade has Nigerian roots. It does, it's Yoruba. Okay, got it. And then Kalia. Kalia is a Hawaiian um, okay. name. If you've been to Honolulu, there's a Kalia Road. Oh, so Kalia is your birth name? Kalia is my birth yeah, name. Yeah, I got you, got you. Okay, yep. okay, okay, got it. My mom was a hula dancer. <laughs> Fun fact. <laughs> Um, okay, so, so I mean, I, I don't want to skip over anything, but I don't know enough to fill in or to lead the question. So what's important between where we are now <laughs> and what we're talking about in your life story and then pillars? Yeah, I go... There's probably a lot, but, but I mean, obviously. So much yeah. of it is in that, like, childhood upbringing, right? Like, okay. I feel like I was oriented to this type of work very young, Um you know, the first, I remember the first, um, I don't know, I remember the first MLK day and like being <laughs> with my dad, you know, and I remember like this consciousness, like in, you know, as a five or six year old. So, um, but I mean, in between then I was a journalist and I thought I was going to save the world one comma splice at a time. <laughs> I was a copy editor and page designer, but I really took that work very seriously. I worked for a local paper that was part of the New was York Times. Was your undergraduate Times degree actually in journalism? It or? Was. Okay. So you it weren't was. like an English major? Um, no, I was a journalism yeah, yeah, major. Okay. And actually in uh, 2000, I was interning. That was the first and only time. I always joke that this was like when we actually had newspaper newspapers and not like a web presence so much. Our web presence was a PDF of the front page that sort of went up on the website, which was fun. But our executive editor actually had to say, stop the press when I was interning uh, the night of the 2000 election. Oh, and wow. And of course, when we didn't know who would be the president. For and were you in days. Florida? I was in Florida. Wow. Okay. Hanging Florida, Chad Florida, Central. Florida. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Hanging Chad Central. <laughs> she took it back. She went back she to did. Hanging Chad's, which for probably a good sleuth of the... Dimpled Chad's. Dimpled like, Chad's. Like right? But I'm saying there's a whole swath of the listening yeah. uh, audience. We just lost them. They just, no they just shut it off. <laughs> right, like newspapers. What? Yeah. Chad? What's it, you know... Some so, you, so you almost had like a Dewey defeats Truman situation. Almost, you? almost. Yeah, and wow. I was an intern, but uh, that that happened. So yeah, yeah, yeah. fascinating. Um, wow. yeah, so okay. I mean, I took yeah. that. To, you know, I right. was active with like the National Association of Black Journalists and the Asian American Journalists, and I was like, we're we're in this truth to power, all of those things. And so I think it, you know, it laid the groundwork for the organizing work that I did later. I took a little stint of stay at home mom time where I stayed engaged with journalism. It lends itself. Uh, to that kind of work and to plugging in, um, did some work in sociology in Virginia. Um, it kind of just all converged. I started at Pillars about three weeks after the 2016 election. Oh, wow. So, okay. Um, okay. again, that, a oh, wow. pretty okay. big inflection point for the Muslim community. Mm. Uh, that conversion for, happened. For many communities. For many communities, absolutely. It's... So, but from your vantage point, I mean, to, to the best of your ability, though, because you've, you've kind of teased Pillars Fund, or we've been teasing Pillars Fund. Tell us a little bit about the Pillars Fund. Yeah. So the Pillars Fund now, we're entering almost our 10th year, which is incredible to okay. think about. Yeah. Um, because it started with, you know, a handful of Muslim families in the United States said, hey, we give to our masajid, right? We give to our kids Islamic schools. Uh, we give, you know, back home, wherever that may be. But we don't have an infrastructure yet to support our civic organizations and those organizations that are, are at the front lines of protecting our civil rights and making sure that we're whole and healthy people outside of our masjids and outside of, you know, this like religious identity. So it was it more about like harnessing the giving power of these group of people or was it about, hey, we're not doing enough to support local American organizations? Or was it a little bit of both? I think it was a little bit of both. Okay. And so I wasn't at the, like, yeah, you know, yeah. the first parts, but as I understand it, uh, and in the stories that are told, it definitely was a little bit about both, right? One is that everyone was sort of giving in different ways, and, and there is so much power behind organizing, right? Collective and collaborative giving and thinking, where, do, where can we be most effective if we all go in the same direction together at the okay. same time? Okay, okay. But then there was absolutely like this part of, you know, we grew up here. Yeah. This is our home now. Right. So like back home is is Fremont, is Chicago, mm -hmm. is, you know, and, yeah. and we have we all have these origin stories that exist beyond that. But right. you know, like what are we building for our children, mm -hmm. for our communities? And so yeah. I think it was a little bit of got, both. Got it. Right. Because 
So, I mean, and, and, we'll, and we'll put a link to this our article, but I think the New York Times did a fascinating article, um, you know, uh, and it, it, it focused or, or it highlighted uh, one particular individual who's involved with the organization, Anas Usman, who I've teased and I've done as much arm twisting as possible to have him on the show, and we will. But um, you sort of proceed uh, uh, on us, so that's uh, you know <laughs> uh, certainly uh, something that you can uh, uh, hold over on us uh, one day. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, Anas Usman, uh, you know, if you're listening, we're going to definitely have you on the show. But um, you've yeah. been warned. Sorry? You've been warned. Yeah, yeah, you've that's right. Warned. That's right. Um, but yeah, because as someone, how do I say this? As someone who knew some of those early pioneers of pillars, and as someone who has been intimately involved with an organization that has benefited greatly from funding from the Pillars Fund, that my understanding was, it was kind of like you said, a combination of both. It was these people like, okay, I'm writing, I write you know, $20,000 checks 10 different times throughout the year, exactly. and they're going to 10 different organizations. And, but, and then, hey, the experiences that I have of that, what I just described, 10 different checks, 20, 10 different organizations, is now shared by like, 20 other people that I know. So why not bring our giving power together and then also have some sort of a um, calculus behind what organization, uh, uh, what organizations, sorry, that we should be funding. Definitely. So, right. And there's so much more collective. But it was nationwide. Knowledge. It wasn't just Chicago based? It's nationwide. Oh, so there were, okay. uh, definitely there's an origin yeah. story here in Chicago. Right. But um, almost immediately, the organizations were in different parts of the country. I hesitate to say nationwide because I don't think we're quite there yet either. And one of the first things, so I mean, there's, it's interesting how pillars evolved, right? These families who were so committed to this idea and got together on their own, coordinated their giving sort of in this once a year, like network expanding, um, you know, way. But right. then there was this other part where our founding executive director, Kashif Sheikh, was like, sometimes in these spaces, and he worked in philanthropy at the McCormick Foundation, um, he would be in these spaces with the Ford Foundation or the Open Societies Foundations, which was like these giant foundations, but they didn't have Muslim voices informing their giving. So they were like, you know what? Muslims are really important right now to this civil rights conversation. Your issues are our issues, but we have no understanding of where to even start or who to talk to. So he became a colleague of theirs pretty quickly, even though relative to what these large endowed foundations were able to, to give, right. Pillars was relatively small. Um, and so Pillars was a resource to these big groups and they were like, why don't you exist? Why aren't you a full-time thing? Why are you, you know, a volunteer um, run entity? Like you're so important to the fabric of this like philanthropic landscape. Wow. So it was almost like, sort of inspiring or motivating that early, like you said, cadre of folks like Gashif and Shakib and others maybe, uh, Anas, who to say, look, you guys can be, you guys you can play. You have something special. Right, right, exactly. Right. You have something special and, you know, play, play, play in the big league. Right. You know, right. you don't need to be in the minors. Yeah, no, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that's the best apt analogy, sorry. And I'm not, I mean, I'm the least guy, well, me and Zucky both probably, to give any sort of semblance of a sports analogy because I'm not a big sports guy. So anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, I think that's apt. I mean, <laughs> Is that apt? Okay. There's a huge, you know, there's so much untapped, so many untapped resources in philanthropy. And, you know, philanthropy ebbs and flows. Like Muslims are really, for lack of, a, you know, there's no other way to say it. Muslims are kind of in right now. Um, it's trendy in a really weird way yeah. to be Muslim, right? Like every... Um, you know, TV show or whatever, people are looking for Muslim participants. Now, we have to be really careful with that, too, because we could end up in situations that we don't necessarily want to be in for exposure or opportunity, right? So we were talking earlier at this conference about diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's not enough just to be, you know, part of the room. Like, are we able to be in spaces and actually make decisions that impact our lives? Or are we serving somebody else's agenda? So we always... Are trying to be mindful of like what you know who are we actually accountable to um are we accountable to these donors yes and bigger than that are we accountable to muslim communities across the united states because and i think that's one of the things i really appreciate about our donors is that they have this understanding that it's bigger than any one of us 
And so they will still give to the organizations that they give to individually. But when it comes to pillars, we are all learning together. We're doing this work together. We're trying to find not only the best work that exists, but like where there's the most need, where there's the most potential. And so when I said I don't, I hesitate to say we're nationwide yet. So we have gaps in our understanding of how Muslim communities operate in certain uh, parts of the country. Gotcha. Um, prior to 2016, we didn't fund in the South. Oh, interesting. Right? Okay. And all of the anti-Muslim bills that came up all originated in Tennessee, Texas, Oklahoma. Florida, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have blind spots that we're learning to address now, but we're doing it together, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had uh, Asma Dean who was involved with the, like, the Murfreesboro case. But, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so, so then, um, and then what's the relationship between the Pillars Fund and then the Chicago Trust? So, so what is the Chicago Trust? The Chicago Community Trust is Sorry, one of Chicago. the oldest um, community foundations in the United States. And initially, uh, what they do really well is work with donor-advised funds and giving circles. So they have a fund that focuses on African-American communities. They have one that focuses on Latino communities, et cetera. Pillars started off as one of those funds, right? It was pretty small, um, you know, it was on par with the other funds. And it just grew so much, mashallah. Like, and so when we were talking with the former president, he was like, yeah, you know, we love this partnership. You can stay, but you've really, you're, you've outpaced, you know, what this fund was set up to oh, do. Wow. Um, and wow. we can, you know, yeah. so it's been a great partnership. They've been an incredible uh, resource to understanding, you know, on a broad scale, how philanthropy in the United States works. Fascinating. No, because you mentioned, a like, for me, what triggered, like, a buzzword for me, which is donor advised funds, because... Mm -hmm. One of the sponsors of our show is the American Muslim Fund, right. which is this sort of growing kind of, you know, um, again, donor advice fund. So, you know, and they're a sponsor of the show. And, uh, you know, um, at, at some point during this conference, we're going to have Muhi on. So we'll definitely have a conversation with Muhi as well. But, um, yeah, so maybe you, from your perspective, tell us about what is a donor advice fund and how that's related to what we were just talking about vis-a-vis -vis, um, pillars. Right. So Pillars definitely did start off more as a donor advised fund. And I think in many donor advised funds, traditionally, um, there is a one person or a group of people who want to give, who want to do, do their philanthropy, but do it through an institution like the Chicago Community Trust. And they will help them identify where to give the money. And then, you know, and they will sort of decide, OK, I want this percentage to go here and this percentage or this amount to go there. And so on. With pillars, I we've used the word donor advice fund, but it really felt more like a giving circle, right? And where everyone is giving in. And then now that we have staff, we have six team members now, which is incredible. Yeah. Um, we, our staff, we spend the time getting to know these organizations around the country. So we're able to kind of go out into the communities and learn and bring it back, as opposed to them just coming to us and applying for funds. Got it. Right. So we, um, at the end of the year, the staff makes recommendations based on those learnings from across the country and over the year to the donors, like based on what we've seen and based on who's applied to us um, and based on our strategy that we've identified for the year, these are the groups we recommend giving to mm. as, a, as a cohort. Got and it. And then the, the, the donors, the trustees, vote yes or no, and um, but they've already committed to this idea before they've given their money. Right. Um, okay, fascinating. So then in that it's analysis... A of, it's a big responsibility and a huge no, trust, yeah, I have to say. Yeah, I can see that. Sounds daunting. <laughs> it's, it's so at, what, what are you seeing and what are you learning about the, about the health and the vitality of Muslim organizations around the country? Yeah. Right? Because see, so... and 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 in my own very limited, limited um, mind of, and, and, and perception of the Muslim community, I, for me, the strength and the vitality of a Muslim organization, and I use strength and vitality to lead the question, but to me, the way I gauge that is along four lines. And this is, again, I've come up with this calculus on my own. This doesn't mean anything. It, this probably has no bearing in any kind of, um, anyway, for people who know better. Sustainability, mm -hmm. uh, scalability, um, I'm forgetting my own points, but sustainability, scalability, uh, intergenerationality, right? And, uh, ident and uh, identity, I guess. So what is the identity of an organization? How is one organization unique from another organization? 
both could be beneficial. The analogy I give and the way I even kind of came up with this, to be honest with you, was sort of me ruminating over a verse of the Quran, which talks about the health, uh, the, the, the health of a tree, right? Mm -hmm. There's an mm -hmm. ayah in Surah, right, which talks about where, you know, the good word is like a good tree and the good tree has these salient features. And the salient features of that good tree are roots that are firm within the earth, branches that reach towards the heavens, and fruit that continue to bear, oh, sorry, a tree that continues to bear fruit regardless of the season yeah. and regardless of the environment. So, the, so the, then sort of ruminating on that, I came up with these four things. And like I said, it, I'm a lawyer delving, who does a podcast on the side delving into this thing. So I would love to hear your thoughts on, first of all, is that you think a good sort of measuring or a calculus to look at how we look at organization with some organizations? And if it is, one, thank you. And two, um, what are you seeing in the Muslim organization? Uh, uh, it, and, it, and I think that's a good yeah. uh, thing to sort of wrap our conversation it, it is. on. Yeah. It is, yeah. So I think these you know, things you mentioned, scalability, sustainability, identity, and intergenerationality, if that's a word. Um, yeah, I know. But I, did, no, I think I just made that up. I don't think that's how you said it. I did. It. I just said, said oh, intergenerationality. Okay. I was like, well, I think. Well, I'll be honest. I, 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 uh, I'm trying to make them all rhyme. I like it. I like it. Um, this is really, there's a lot of overlaps in how we think about it. And I okay. think the only one, so I'll back up a little bit. So we saw, we've been able to, one thing we've been able to do with getting, you know, 200 applications a year now, wow. which is massive wow. amounts of information to there go was a, through. I mean, I literally can remember a time where uh, Pillars was boasting 80. No, mashallah, even mashallah. back then at yep. 80, when I attended one of the dinners, one of the annual banquets that you do, which are amazing events. Uh, and, and it was just, just the opportunity to see, again, like the health and vitality of the Muslim right. organization, uh, Muslim community and where we are. Uh, it was just an eye-opening uh, experience for me. And I attended just, you know, one, maybe it was 2013, 2015, maybe? Maybe 2014. Was it here in Chicago? It was here in Chicago. Right. It was here in Chicago. I remember Rami and Osama. Yes, Bob yes, yes, yes. And... That's right, that's right. Um, yep. And uh, where was I going with that? Sorry. Um, it, so at, the that, at that time, it was 80, right. I think. And right. Gashif had mentioned that number, and now 200. 200. The last three wow. years, we've gotten about 200 or 202, 203 applications. And we ask, we formalize the process a lot. One thing you can do with staff right. <laughs> is, you know, put oh, yeah. everything into a system. And so one thing we know is that about 70% of the organizations that we receive applications from that identify as like being led by Muslim, Arab, or South Asian. Or, oh yeah, so, so what are the qualifiers right. in order to so, even, yeah. So, yeah, uh, so we, we to, qual to qualify for our pillars, you know, to, just to apply, right. you need to be working, you know, with either in or alongside a Muslim community. And okay. we're pretty intentional about that, right? Like something to do with lifting up the leadership of Muslim, uh, Muslim leadership, right? Lifting up the, the work that Muslims do. And that can be tricky, um, but we, but of the groups who identified in some way as being led by Muslim, Arab, or South Asian organizations, like people, yes. um, or that was their issue focus, about 70% of those emerged post-2001. So, so there's this like inflection point right after that time where there was a crisis in our community and we didn't have the infrastructure tools to address it. Now, some organizations predate that, right? Like Iman, for example, was here in Chicago organizing, doing their thing. So they were in a different position when that happened. They had different credibility in the community when that took place, so they could activate pretty quickly. Um, a group like the Arab American Family Association, or service, Arab American Family Services here, which is not a current Pillars grantee, but part of access? this- Access, is that? No, oh, Access. Oh, sorry, Access um, is different. Right? They're part of the Access Network, but oh, they're okay. a, a group here in the Chicago suburbs. They were founded September 1st, 2001. So you can imagine like their whole program model and everything had to shift within 10 days of existing. So we're understanding that sustainability piece is so important because so many of our organizations have been in crisis mode from the beginning of their existence and constantly fighting fires. And then we saw a similar um, trend after 2016 where there was this burst of new organizations mm -hmm. after the 2016 election in you know, addressing the Muslim ban, for example, um, in an attempt to equip more people who wanted to run for office or be politically engaged. 
uh, there was this huge, you know, burst of innovation and, and stuff after 2016. So sustainability is really important. And it's not, you know, it's easy to sort of count quote unquote wins, but it's like, are our people, um, are they healthy? Are they well? Are they able to do this work long term? This is hard work for so many of them. Um, and when I talk about you know uh, uh, sustainability, I'm talking about not just the organization as a whole, but the individuals that are part of it. Exactly. It's it, and because yeah, sorry. No, yeah. I mean uh, it's it's really. It's, do they have a retirement plan? Wow. Right. I'm glad Our, that that's part of the assessment. We ha and, and it's not just like okay, you don't have this, so therefore you we can't give you a grant. <laughs> go, right. It's like. How can we help all of us Beautiful. get to that point? So wait, do these grant funds award great work? Yes. But do they also like try to help plant some seeds? Now our grants aren't huge, but even having, you know, the flexibility, most of our grants are general operating support. So yes. even having the flexibility to take 10, 25, $50,000 and do whatever you need to do with it to make sure your organization is healthy can go a really long way. It really, month. really it's, can. Because a lot of these organizations are zakat funded so mm -hmm. and and th th that automatically places certain limitations on how right. that money can be spent you know sharia compliant sharia compliant right. but then there's also like you said i mean just to get that little bit of inoculation for the year to get that 10 15 20 thousand dollar grant money that that you can do whatever you want with and as long as and, and then of course i know there's checks within certain bounds i was on commenting on how part. how much of a boost that is even though like you said maybe in the operating life or the operating budget of an organization 10 to 15 10 to 20 thousand dollars maybe nothing but it, it 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 helps because it's coming with i don't want to say no strings attached but it's coming with like you know what i mean like you have the flexibility to do whatever you want with that funding and that's very very important and i think there's you know the model that you're that you're operating with. There's other organizations that I know, grant you know, grant providing organizations. Um, what's the word? Um, yeah, yeah. So that 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 basically fund certain projects or mm -hmm. certain parts of, of of an organization's mission statement. You don't, or Pillars doesn't. Right. We because we're. Um... Yeah. Thank you. The door is not quite closed. Yeah, just... <laughs> yeah. Okay, no problem. Um, so because we are funding in the Muslim community, and I mentioned that Muslims, for better or for worse, are on trend right now, it's, e it's not easy, but you know, an, or a bigger foundation will likely give a project-based or program fund, right? Like, we really love this legal program that you have, um, and we can support it. However, we can't support you know, your staff retreat that you need or, you know, the sabbatical that your executive director needs after 15 years of continuous service without a break, right? So this is where I think we feel this obligation to the community to really plug in the holes where, you know, the larger foundations can't or maybe Zakat funding cannot. Um, this is something we take pretty seriously. And it's a trend, I would say, in philanthropy as well. So we aren't out here by ourselves. There are there's more of an emphasis now in general operating support on capacity building. Okay. And so we uh, that also helps in explaining, you know, to people who may not already be a part of the Pillars Network. Mm -hmm. um, we're not out here just making stuff up and being like, here, take this money, you know, do whatever you want with it. Buy a whole bunch of paper clips. Straight. Um, this is. A, a, an emerging best practice in philanthropy, understanding that the problems that our people are addressing are generations in the making. And so we're yeah. not gonna solve it in a three-year work plan. There you go, yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, yeah. well, thank you for just, in the short term, in, in terms of like the last five minute conversation for hopefully uh, uh, fleshing out some of, that, some of that raw data that I spewed out. I would love to kind of talk more with you about that, maybe to. obviously off, off, off air. In you don't want to do that on air? <laughs> in terms of fleshing that out. But I, I, I hope, my hope is that, how do I say this? So, so we, we touched on a lot, but I hope that you feel that we didn't, that we did justice to not only your own personal story, but also the story of, of, of pillars. So I hope we've done that part. 
Thank you for the opportunity. I mean, no, no, I think no. I on sincerely mean that. All fronts. I mean, there are so many people who are part of the pillar story, and I'm just one of those. And I feel really privileged. You're, you're to one be, pillar. I am one. <laughs> one pillar of many pillars. <laughs> um, I love it. Zucky comes in with these, yeah. Yeah, but I'm, it's yeah. just such a privilege and, like I said, a pretty big responsibility and a trust that I, I feel, you know, really humbled to be uh, entrusted with such a with, with such a great task uh, for so many people who I love and respect. So for people, so we always end with this. So, like, where can people find you? Where can people engage you online or elsewhere? And then number two, though, because you are here on behalf of an organization, how can people find out more about Pillars and how can they either become donors or how can they, um, uh, you know, how can this uh, little garage band podcast, for example, apply for a nice little grant? No, I'm joking. Okay. Great. No, no, but, but how can that's really time. what this was all about. <laughs> this was all what this was about. It cats out of the bag now. <laughs> But I saved it till the end. That's that's good. That's, that's pretty right, that's pretty right. strategic. Yeah, um, it was the bait and switch. Sorry. So uh -huh. yeah. So personally, uh, you know, Twitter, Instagram, all of those things. I like to spell out the pronunciation no, no, of do. my name, right? Because sometimes people look at Kalia and they're like, "What, Kayla? Kayla?" So it's K U H L E E U H on Twitter. So Kalia. Okay. Can't get it wrong. So that's not your spelling, but you kind of. Um, uh, transliterate. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. A transliteration. Transliteration, if you will, or a phonetic is the better word. Right. Sorry. And then, uh, but Pillars Fund on Twitter, um, Facebook, and Instagram. We're all over the place. And Thank you so much, Kalia. I know, no, it's really, it's been a fascinating conversation. I mean, really yeah. Has. Well, and, and we appreciate you taking time out of the Muppies conference to chat with us. Thank you for inviting me. And I, I look forward to continuing our chat on strategy. Absolutely, thank you so much. And and I think you're, uh, it's lunchtime right now, so you probably wanna gr grab some. Grab that's some. right, that's right. And, and and for our listeners, as always, please engage us, please reach out to us, diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can always um, um, reach us on Facebook, facebook.com facebook slash diffusecongruence. We have been talking about funding. We are also on Patreon, so you can become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash diffusecongruence. Thank <laughs> you.